too. Okay, so next we're going to talk about the phases of matter, which are just the states of matter. You guys have been learning about this since you were like six. All right, we're going to talk about solids, liquids, and gases. And um, now, when you are going from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas, in this direction, as we trend in this direction, it's really important to understand what's going on with the particles. So you've got matter in the solid state, very tightly placed together, little, 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 little movement. There's very, very, very low kinetic energy, okay? Now, as we trend this way, that energy begins to increase. That's why when you've got a definite shape with a solid, that shape is not so definite anymore when it's a liquid. The particles are now gathering up energy. Energy is increasing as we go this way. There is what we call energy being absorbed, okay, as we go this way, okay? And so, I'll erase these arrows for just a second. So as we go from solid to a liquid, liquid to a gas, now when you get to the gas state, that's when energy is at its highest, okay? Now, we've talked about endothermic and exothermic processes. We're going to talk about how this can, th these processes are actually a part of phase changes in matter. If a solid goes to a liquid and liquid to a solid, uh, or a liquid to a gas, rather, those particles are absorbing energy. What do we call it when you absorb or gain in energy? The, the, right here, this is endothermic, all right? This is an endothermic process because these particles must gain energy. They must take in heat in order to transition between these states. Now, which states are we looking at right here as we go from a solid to a liquid to a gas? Well, when you go from a solid to a liquid, right here, this is where we melt, right? And then when we go from a liquid to a gas, this is when we, uh, this is when something vaporizes, okay? Um, vaporization, also called evaporation, same thing, all right? Um, basically the same process where the particles, those atoms, those molecules are gathering up energy and they are going through an endothermic change, all right? Now, you have to realize that this can go both ways. Energy can be absorbed, it can be added, it can go into the system. These particles are, have more energy than they did in the previous state. You also have the contrasting action, which is where our arrows are going to go in a different direction. We're gonna now go from, if, we, if you are traveling from the gas to the liquid state and then the liquid to the solid state, okay, Energy is actually being um, released. Energy is being lost. So energy lost, okay? It's being released, okay? These particles are slowing down. They're at this really highly energized state as a gas, and then they slow down a little bit, okay? They now have a definite volume, but no definite shape. A liquid, once they go to the liquid state, that is, this is what we call condensation, all right, condensation is when gas particles turn into um, uh, slow down, they lose energy, and then they liquefy. Now, once a liquid, uh, liquid particles, if even more energy keeps, we keep dropping down that energy, and energy keeps being released and lost, then they will freeze, okay? They will solidify, all right, and go to the solid state, all right? Now, energy being lost or released, we call this an exothermic process, okay? Exiting heat, okay? Energy is being released. In order for these particles to actually stop moving so quickly and stop moving so rapidly, that kinetic energy gets lost, and that makes it exothermic. Now, what I'm not demonstrating up here, which I will on the phase diagram, is those two other phase changes that are not quite as common, so students uh, don't typically mention them or relate to them as much, which is sublimation and deposition. But I'm going to show you that in a phase diagram, okay? Now, phase diagrams have the same basic structure. Most of the time, they're going to give you the phase diagram of water, okay? And each phase diagram is comparing how temperature and pressure affect the state that matter is in, okay? Now, the phase diagram, the same structure every time there is, this is your solid section, this is gonna be the liquid section, and this is the gas section, okay? Now, um, temperature is typically going to be measured in degrees Celsius, and so we're gonna go ahead and get that on here.
Now pressure, pressure at STP is one atmosphere. This is our typical pressure is one atmosphere. This could be a half an atmosphere here. I also want to mention this little spot right here where all three phases of matter converge at one um, in, at those that coordinates, which right here we can say that it is around 0.4 atmospheres and a temperature of about 25 degrees. So around 25 degrees Celsius and uh, atmospheric pressure of about 0.4. This point recall is triple point, okay? It is the point where all states of matter for this particular substance, whether this be water or some other type of that simpler form of matter, that's what this would be, uh, what we call its triple point. Now, in, in each section, each one of these curves is where we see the potential for phase changes to occur, all right? So, um, Solid can go to a liquid right here. Liquid goes to a solid. These are what we call contrasting. This is, if a solid is going to a liquid, um, then that means that the particles are gaining energy. Um, that is going to be where the particles are actually bringing in and taking in energy. So it would be endothermic. And so solid to liquid, this is when we're melting. Endothermic, all right? This would be the contrasting exothermic process. Well, when we go from a liquid to a solid, those particles are actually slowing down. They're releasing energy. That's exothermic, okay? So freezing would be exothermic. And this is, again, it's all about when you label endothermic and exothermic, it's all about the particles. Think about what they're doing. Are they slowing down? They must be releasing energy. You release energy, that's exothermic, okay? Freezing, the particles slow down to a solid, all right? Now, I did want to mention that when we go from solid to a gas, this is where we skip the liquid phase. This is what we call sublimation. This is what happens with dry ice, with frozen carbon dioxide, when it goes from solid carbon dioxide to a gas immediately. Sublimation, if you're going from a solid, particles are barely moving, then you go to the gas and you're everywhere, you have gained energy. That would be endothermic, just like melting is endothermic. Those particles have had to have gained energy and brought absorbed energy in to start um, uh, hiring or for their kinetic energy to increase like that. Now, the opposite of sublimation, which is going to be the exothermic process where they release energy and slow down, is deposition. This would be like frozen precipitation in the upper levels of our atmosphere when those gases and that water vapor goes immediately to a solid and creates snowflakes, okay, or, or hail uh, that's created that is going to be from a gas state to a solid state. And of course, over here, when you go from a liquid gas, that's vaporization, also known as evaporation, and then Going from a gas to liquid, that's condensation. Condensation is when the particles slow down. This would be the exothermic. This would be the endothermic process, all right? Now, you also have to be able to kind of, when, when Victor, are we good on, are we going? Yeah. Okay. Check to make sure we're still rolling and keep getting cut off. Um, another thing that you have to consider is if this particular substance, if the temperature remains constant at 40 degrees, so let's just say we're at 40 degrees and we say, okay, temperature is constant, means it's not changing. How, if we're, um, if the substance is in the gas state, okay, and temperature is constant, how could we cause it to condense? How could we cause it to go to the liquid state, to go through condensation if the temperature is remaining constant? If we're at 40 degrees, how do you get this gas to condense, to go into the liquid state of matter. Well, you would have to increase the pressure, okay? You can't manipulate this, but you can increase the pressure, okay? Certain questions like that. Or you could say something like, how can we get this solid, um, if, if the solid, if we're at 25 degrees, okay, and we're in the solid state, okay, how do we melt? We could increase the temperature, Okay, we could drop the pressure, okay? Um, one of two different things. So you've gotta be able to look at the points on here on, the, on your phase diagram and being able to look at your X versus your Y and then knowing what transitions occur at each phase, okay? So those are your phase uh, diagrams as well as understanding particle behavior. Remember, it's all about are those particles slowing down? Are they speeding up? If they speed up, Okay, they've got to take in energy, endothermic. If they slow down, they've got to release energy, exothermic, okay? Now, speaking of endo and exothermic, you can also apply this to not phase changes, because that's just a physical change, but actual chemical changes, actual chemical reactions, okay? So, they, uh, endothermic and exothermic reactions, when you have, all right, so they, this is going to be kind of the bare bones of what these graphs look like, okay? And this is just the, the reaction, the 
reaction time down here, all right? So from the beginning of the reaction to the ending. And so this is kind of essentially what you're gonna see when you look at exothermic versus endothermic. Now, um, this is going to be your energy, actually your potential energy, which is stored chemical energy. Okay, so you got your energy, and I'm just gonna put PE for potential energy right here. Okay, so with this alone, you should be able to tell which one is exo, which, which one's endothermic. Potential energy is low, but then it ends up high, okay? That means that energy had to be brought in. Energy is absorbed, it is gained, it is added, whatever you wanna call it, those all mean the same thing. If energy is gained and brought in, this is an endothermic graph, okay? This is what we're seeing here, energy gained. All right, now, exothermic, you can see that right here at the beginning of our reaction, the reactants have high energy, but then it drops down once we get to the products. Why? Because energy exits, energy is lost, energy is released. All those things meaning the same thing, okay? And so this means exo, think energy exits, okay? Exothermic, energy is gone, it's lost released, all right? So in an endothermic reaction, the reactants have low potential energy. They need more energy to actually build up the products, the bonds for the products that they're creating, so they have to gain energy. Now that is why delta H is actually called your change in enthalpy, um, okay? And it's the change in your heat energy. And in an endothermic reaction, delta H is positive, okay? Positive kilojoules, because typically energy is gonna be measured in kilojoules in terms of chemical bonds, okay? Now, delta H is positive here. Delta H is negative when it's an exothermic reaction because energy is released. It's given to the surroundings, to the environment, okay? So, delta H is positive here. Delta H is negative here. You need kilojoules of energy brought in to make bonds. Over here, you need to release kilojoules of energy because you have excess energy, bonds have been broken, you get rid of that extra, uh, extra energy. Now, when you get rid of that extra energy over here, that's where the environment, that beaker that maybe the reaction's occurring in, the environment, the, the vessel, the reaction vessel, is going to turn warm, okay? It's gonna get warmer. All right, the environment is benefiting from that energy being released. Over here, the environment, the environment is actually the victim where they, it gets, the environment gets, I'm misspelling that, okay. Environment gets colder because these reactants need energy from the environment. So they rob the energy from the environment in order to build up the products. And so what happens? That beaker or whatever reaction vessel that you're mixing uh, the, the chemicals in gets colder, okay? Because that energy went into making the products, all right? So you could see a reaction that looks somewhat like this. So if you had, and I'm just making up numbers here, but if you had calcium oxide and it says, So this is the decomposition of calcium um, oxide, and you can see this right here tells me that this is an endothermic chemical reaction, not just because it has a positive kilojoules for your delta H, but it just tells you that in order for this to break down chemically, we need energy brought in, okay? And conversely, you can have a reaction where you've got aluminum plus copper two chloride, and that gives you um, and no, I'm not balancing this right this second. I'm just trying to make a point that you're going to see, you're going to see delta H, like I'm just making up numbers here, but you'll see negative 460 kilojoules. That tells me this is exothermic because we brought these two things together. There was excess energy left over once these bonds were formed. And so it gets released. We're losing that energy. Energy is released and kilojoules um, though that energy comes from the bonds that were broken and it's extra energy and it gets released to the environment, the beaker's warm, okay? This was the reaction we did in lab a few weeks ago, okay? Now, that's endothermic versus exothermic.